everybody. Uh, these series of lectures are going to cover uh, chapters 34 and 29, which uh, is gas exchange and transport in plants and animals. So let's start um, with gas exchange, okay? So we've talked about before how a organism, like a single-celled organism, exchanges materials directly with the environment. So if you had a cell, uh, the cell in the environment, well, uh, it would uh, be floating in the ocean, let's say, and it would exchange materials directly with the environment. However, um, when we're multicellular, that's no longer possible, so we begin to evolve um, structures to help us do that. So here we see in this aquatic salamander, this is a patamorphic salamander, meaning it has juvenile functions as an adult. That's a term we introduced earlier this semester, patamorphic, uh, childlike features. It's an, a sexually mature adult, but it has gills. And look at those gills. Look at the structure of those gills. Think about the function of those gills and look at the structure. And notice the ways that they have evolved massive amounts of increased surface area to facilitate gas exchange. So um, just let's go back in time here to the Paleozoic, the early Paleozoic era. Um, there were great big arthropods back then. So let's talk, talk about arthropods for a moment. That's like uh, relatives of insects and things. Um, they, they were arthropods that were bigger than a human back then. Well, how uh, in the modern world, we don't see that. We see lots of tiny ones, but we don't see giant arthropods. So how is that possible? How is it possible that a dragonfly in, in that area would have a wingspan of over two feet wide? Well... Um, back then, we can see that there was a massive increase in the amount of atmospheric oxygen. So here's modern day levels of oxygen. This is where it was back in the uh, mid-Paleozoic, which having, uh, having that amount of oxygen around made it easier for those organisms to uh, have gas exchange. It allowed them to get bigger. They could get even bigger than they can now because oxygen was more freely available. So it's really cool how we can see a correlation between the amount of oxygen available and the size of certain organisms and things like that. It affects evolution. Gas exchange is really important. So if we look at an arthropod, such as uh, this grasshopper here, and let me pause this a moment and try to make those words visible. Okay, so if we look at this arthropod here, um, this is a you know, like a grasshopper. They have air sacs inside their bodies that you can see uh, labeled there. And they have tubes called tracheae. That's plural. Trachea is singular. And this is how a lot of insects do gas exchange anyway. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail here. Um, so if we zoom in on, on the grasshopper, we can see that there are openings in the grasshopper. Hopper, and those, uh, those openings allow gases to come in and out. Um, and they lead to tubes called a trachea. The trachea branches into smaller tubes called tracheoles. And then those tracheoles end up branching out actually into, and they actually touch or are very close to cells. So these are cells of the body. And there are air sacs that help store some of that air as well. So what happens here is the insects bring in air into these trachea that branch into these smaller tracheoles and almost or practically every cell of the insect's body is close to part of one of these tracheoles. Okay? So here's a cell of the body and here's the tracheal branched out around those cells. So all cells are close to respiratory system, to a tracheal. That means they can easily have gas exchange to all cells of the body, okay? That's one of the ways insects do it. Other insects might have gills and things, but we're going to talk about the typical land insect. This is why, by the way, um, you can kill some insects, like in your garden, by spraying them with soapy water because it plugs up these openings to the outside world. It plugs up the openings to the uh, trachea, and then the insects can't breathe. So that's uh, a, a organic, you know, a, a, what do I want to say, a non-pesticide way of controlling certain insects in the garden. But notice how the structure of this 
tube is very similar to the structure of our trachea. Here's a human trachea. See the rings on the trachea? Those make that tube stiffer and harder to collapse. If you think about the tube of a vacuum cleaner, we've done the same thing on appliances in our, in our home. We put the same kind of structures into place. So this is convergence in the case of these two tubes having similar structures to keep them from collapsing. And in fact, we see similar thickenings here in this drawing on the right in plants and some of their tissues. So uh, convergence is really common in the world of anatomy and physiology. Now, single cell organisms, like we said before, exchange directly with the environment. Multicellular organisms can exchange some things with the environment as well. Here's an example of a frog uh, that has blood vessels, so much more complex than, an, than a single-celled uh, protist, uh, yeah, protist over here. But here we have gas exchange through the skin directly with the environment. In order to have gas exchange with the environment, uh, you have to have a moist skin because air diffuses, dissolves into the water and then crosses the skin into the blood. So you have to have a thin, moist skin in order to have direct gas exchange with the environment, which we have in some of our amphibians. Of course, in other organisms, we have different gas exchange mechanisms. So, for example, in fish, we have gills. If we zoom in on a gill, uh, we see a structure like, like this, and which we'll explain a little more later. And if we zoom in on lungs... In mammals, we'll see a lot of surface area in the form of alveoli, and, and they're all surrounded by tons of blood vessels. Um, and we'll see that a little bit later as well. Now, let's start with gills, kind of the outgroup to the land animals, right? Fish need about 4 to 15 milligrams of oxygen per liter in the water to survive, depending on the species and things like that. That's, uh, you know, I mean, it's hard to put that into context, but keep in mind that there's at least 30 times that much oxygen available in the air, in the atmosphere. And of course, as you change temperature of the water, there's less and less oxygen available. So in, in uh, cool water, you might hold more oxygen. You might hold quite a bit up here. Uh, but in warm water, you have a lot less oxygen available. So fish have a lot less oxygen available to them than a land animal does because not as much oxygen dissolves in the water as there is in the atmosphere, okay? And there's a, this is a reason why there are no endotherms with gills. Endotherms have a high metabolic rate. We have to generate our own body temperature, right? There's not enough oxygen in the water to act as the final electron acceptor in respiration to keep an endotherm alive. So uh, only ectotherms have gills. Of course, there are also ectotherms with, with lungs, as we saw with the frog or, the, or a reptile. So um, I'm going to stop this video here, and I'm going to pick up with how fish... Uh, accomplish gas exchange in this low oxygen environment. So remember, the air has a, a lot more oxygen than the water. So how is it that a fish can get enough oxygen to survive uh, in an aquatic environment? That's where we'll pick up in the next video.